Kathy Curry. I'm a technology manager with State Farm. Um, I'm located in our office in Richardson. I'm also a member of the Tech Titans program team, and we are the ones that are responsible for producing and bringing these awesome and outstanding events to you. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with Tech Titans, it's the largest technology trade association in the state with approximately 375 corporate members that stretch across the region. Uh, for the past 23 years, the Tech Industry Luncheon has brought visionary leaders and subject matter experts on the cutting edge trends and technologies. And this is just one of the many programs that Tech Titans produces each year to support and promote the North Texas technology industry. Tech Titans is winding down 2020. What a crazy year it's been. Um, we only have a few um, events left on the calendar. Our next one is the Analytics and Insights Forum, which will be presented on uh, December 3rd. And the topic is running an effective and efficient analytics project with Caleb Baucom of L3 Harris and Lee Green of Tokyo Electron. And then two times in December, Tech Titans presents the Executive Innovation Lecture Series with the innovation expert and Harvard Innovation Fellow, Dr. David Ricketts. This marks uh, the final tech industry luncheon of 2020 today. So please mark your calendar for January 22nd. It's the fourth Friday in January. Mike Buffon, the Vice President of Toyota Manufacturing North America and um, Mexico, and um, will be our, I've got that all butchered, so let me just back up and make sure. Mike Buffon, the Vice President of Toyota Manufacturing North America and Mexico for Toyota, will be our keynote speaker. All right, um, more information is available on these and all upcoming programs on Tech Titans website, which is www.techtitans.org. If you're not a member of Tech Titans and you are interested in joining, you can contact Barbara Tunstall. She's a sales representative for Tech Titans and her email address is barbara at techtitans.org or you can call her at 214-555-4559767. So that's 214-455-9767. So for today's presentation, you can ask questions, uh, post, the, post those in the chat room. The icon is in the lower row of commands at the bottom of your screen. We'll moderate those and ask them for you. We're also delighted to announce that we will be hosting a post-presentation networking Q&A session today, immediately after the conclusion of the presentation. And we'll do that from 1 to 1.30. So we do hope that you can stick around for this part of the program. The presenting sponsor of the Tech Industry Luncheon Series in 2020 is the UTD Design Program at the University of Texas at Dallas. So for a few words about the university, please welcome the Director of Corporate Relations for the Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science, Don Prochal. Thank you, Kathy, and happy Friday before Thanksgiving, everybody. Hey, I've got a question for you. Do you have more engineering and computer science needs than you have engineers and computer scientists? Of course you do. And we can help. We have an amazing nationally renowned senior design capstone program. That's uh, capstones required for all universities in the US with undergraduate computer science and engineering programs. We think we have one of the best, if not the best in America. We have uh, just received results from the American Society of Mechanical Engineers Manufacturing Science and Engineering Conference. Well, we've won first place in the United States in 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, and yes, 2019. Took second place last year, and well, in 2020, we got our results and we finished in second place. Oh, wait, we also finished in first place. So we took the top spots again as well. So we're crushing, we're absolutely crushing it. At the, at the National Capstone Design Conference, we've won the last three of those. They're held every two years, 2014, 2016, 2018. What happened in 2020? COVID. So UT Dallas is going to host it in 2022 because the other universities in the United States want to know what is our secret sauce and why do we keep winning? So uh, 
we're launching nearly 300 capstone projects this academic year. It was 120 just four years ago. So uh, we're the victims of our own success. We're launching 135 projects in January and we need your help. So if you need help with engineering or computer science projects, please sign up as a sponsor. I'm going to put contact information for me and for Rod Wetterskog in the chat window when I'm done. Uh, pro if you submit a project proposal by December 18th, we will give you a $2,000 discount for each and every project that you submit a proposal for. So that's all I have to say about Capstone. And now I'm, the Tech Industry Luncheon is pleased to have the Health Tech Forum co-host today's presentation. For more about the Health Tech Forum and the introduction of our keynote speaker, Please welcome Health Tech Forum Tri Chair and my friend and colleague Pete Corman of the University of Texas at Dallas. Pete. Thank you, Don. The Health Tech Forum is really delighted to be part of this luncheon program today and have the opportunity to bring you today's speaker. The, the purpose of the Health Tech Forum is to provide a community here in the Dallas Fort Worth area where we can explore applications, drive partnerships, and promote health technology in general. We believe this will strengthen all of the health technology businesses in the area. Uh, one of the themes of the Health Tech Forums is to been, been a series of programs we call the Game Changers series. This is where entrepreneurial startup companies are brought forward to describe the way that they're doing truly innovative things in bio, medical, and health technology. And it's the Game Changer series that today brings us our presentation by Lucas Rodriguez of Cersei Therapeutics. Lucas is a businessman with a strong background in biomedical engineering. He's won numerous awards in entrepreneurship, business development, and prides himself as a problem solver but he leverages his engineering expertise in everything he does and takes a very analytical approach to business. Lucas first told Tech Titans about the work that he's going to talk about today in a Game Changer series. And this was three years ago when the fledgling company was just coming into being. Uh, they then raised significant capital and uh, brought a, uh, something to market that we'll hear about from Lucas just in just a moment or two. So with that, it is my pleasure to join you in welcoming CEO of Circe Therapeutics, Lucas Rodriguez. <clears throat> all right, thank you all so much for having me. Uh, thank you, Pete, uh, Tech Titans, everybody on. Uh, it's nice to see and read some familiar faces here. Um, I've got some slides to show. I did notice Greg Dussor is on, uh, one of my original co-founders. Um, so, hey, Greg. Uh, one thing I wanted to say, I'm pretty easy going. I don't know if you guys have an ability to unmute yourselves and, and answer or ask questions. Feel free to do so if you can. And if not, you can drop them in the chat as we're going. You don't have to wait to the end. Uh, fairly informal kind of situation here. Um, so my name is Lucas Rodriguez. I'm the one of the co-founders and uh, the previous CEO now of Circe Therapeutics. Uh, as a, as a first start here, one thing I would like to do is recognize that as luck would have it, I happen to be in the UT Dallas ROC building at the Venture Development Center, which coincidentally is where all of this started. Uh, it was our first office space um, and uh, our, you know, basically where, where the, all of this began. Um, I'm up here doing a little bit of diligence on another project and working on some other things, but uh, it's just funny that I happen to be in this room for this particular um, presentation. Uh, additionally, one of the things I would like to mention is everybody uh, had an opportunity to plug UT Design. I'd like the opportunity to be able to do that as well, um, both as a member of the Circe Therapeutics team, uh, where we did three or four projects with the UT Design team, all of which were very successful, um, as well as giving me my first job uh, prior to or concurrent with developing Circe. Uh, I was a faculty member for a very brief period of time uh, working on the EPICS project uh, or EPICS team there through the UT Design Group, the Engineering Projects and Community Service. Uh, not only is uh, UT Design a fantastic program, but I'm, I got a very uh, special place in my heart for the EPICS program um, and think uh, everybody should take a look at that and have an opportunity to get involved if they're able to. Um, 
I'd like to start uh, today just kind of going through our story. Again, um, you know, there's certain things I can and can't say. One thing I'd like to start with is uh, Cersei Therapeutics or Cersei Therapeutics, which I'll probably go back and forth saying Cersei and Cersei. We'll talk about why that is uh, in a few slides here. Uh, we were acquired by Acadia Pharmaceuticals, uh, ticker symbol ACAD or ACAD, um, back in August of this year. Um, we're bound by certain confidentiality provisions uh, that re restrict me from saying certain things um, about it. Uh, so if I don't say something that you guys are interested in hearing about, please feel free to ask a question um, and let me know and I'll, I'll do my best to either answer it or, or let you know why uh, I cannot. Uh, so in jumping into it, um, I started my career um, in academia. So as everyone did, I went to undergraduate or everyone here, I'm sure, went to undergraduate school somewhere. I decided to do mine at Baylor University, pictured here. Um, and uh, I did my, my undergrad in biology and chemistry and originally thought that I was destined to go be a, a medical doctor. Um, what ended up happening was I graduated and, and realized that, you know, I didn't want to just have no experience and be one of those people who went from undergrad to a medical degree. And, and you know, you just basically you just turn into, uh, I hate to say it, but a, a little bit of a pawn, as it were, uh, in doing medicine. And that's probably not the right way to say that, but uh, I suppose I just have. Um, so uh, effectively what happened with me was I decided, okay, well, I'm going to go to graduate school in uh ended up being UT Dallas. Uh, and I'm going to do a master's in biomedical engineering with an intention to leverage that master's into uh, some sort of a research and consulting role once I ultimately went into, into medicine. Uh, my laboratory team is here on the right. I was uh, under the guidance of Daniele Rodriguez with an S, not a Z. There's actually no relation. Um, and it's actually because of these people and particularly Daniele um, that you know I ended up finding a real strong desire to get involved with technology development. Um, so even in getting into school uh, for my master's, I still thought I was going to go into medicine. And effectively, it was through my experience in, uh, in research and development at the University of Texas at Dallas uh, that I ultimately decided that I wanted to pivot my efforts into uh, do getting a terminal degree in biomedical engineering, where I ultimately got my, my PhD in biomedical engineering studying titanium bone, um, both bone cements as well as titanium dental up, uh, abutments for cranial facial research. Um, I decided fairly early on in graduate school that I, that I had a strong desire in technology development. So my PhD was actually centric around obviously getting publications and doing good research, but specifically using guidance documents uh, published by FDA to develop our technology in such a way uh, that we'd have an ability to uh, commercialize that technology. It, it wasn't prior or it wasn't until uh, I had an opportunity to really learn what that meant, uh, that I realized that it's very difficult to develop technology that you yourself were involved in at the, at the university level. Um, and it's easier to partner with a group that's already been doing it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the problem or pain point here, um, some pun intended, of course, uh, the opioid epidemic. So what a lot of people don't realize is is the loss of life um, associated with the 9-11 terrorist attacks, um, which are so fundamentally um, you know, recognized in our culture uh, that all we have to do is say the word 9-11 and everybody remembers exactly what happened as they should. But that loss of life uh, occurs several, several times a week um, associated with the opiate epidemic at this point. Um, and uh, the, 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 the media, Pharmaceutical companies, um, really pharma in general, uh, just really avoided even talking about this. Lots of people were making and are making lots of money on selling opioids. Opioids have a place in medicine. They simply don't belong in your medicine cabinet. And so uh, two really fundamentally fantastic scientists that are both here at the University of Texas at Dallas uh, started looking at this a number of years ago, uh, Drs. Greg DeSore and Ted Price. Um, and it wasn't until I met them that I really started to, to appreciate this. So in 2016, 175 Americans died from a drug overdose every day. Obviously not all of those are associated with opioids, but the large majority of them are. Uh, these numbers are staggering. Um, you know, it's just something that people should have been paying a lot more attention to. And unfortunately, it wasn't until uh, 2015 uh, when uh, the, the then Surgeon General Vivek Murthy 
uh, had a call to action uh, in the physician community uh, to start recognizing this problem that it really started getting mainstream media attention. As a handful of other numbers here, 300,000 overdose deaths involving opioids since 2000. Um, this is effectively uh, the number of, you know, any very close to any, you know, world war that we've had uh, on our side. Um, and effectively what ended up happening uh, was, again, nobody was paying attention to it because of all of the, all of the dollars that were being made uh, in selling these particular pro products. Uh, I won't belabor the point. Um, we're all aware of the opioid epidemic and uh, the deleterious problems that it's having. <clears throat> um, but really, really, it came down to a lack of alternatives, right? When people are in pain, they need something to alleviate that pain, at least to some degree. Uh, they certainly don't need to go from, you know, a three to a, you know, negative seven, which is effectively what opioids do. Um, you know, opioids aren't, aren't bad or evil, right? If you break your femur or you get shot, I promise you're going to be begging for something to make that pain go away. And you're going to need something like an opioid. As I mentioned, they have a place in medicine. We just shouldn't have them widely available to ourselves at any given time. Um, and God forbid, you know, our, our children and loved ones. It just, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, so when I met Ted and Greg, uh, you know, what was basically happening was the pharmaceutical industry had retreated from a lot of this neuroscience work and basically had said, look, the government, um, small businesses and academic institutions are effectively eventually gonna solve this problem. It costs a lot of money for a pharmaceutical manufacturer, a, a large money, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturer with all of their overhead to be able to develop novel pharmaceuticals, right? Because every time they run a project, the overhead and the costs associated with it with all of their people are tremendous. So every time they have a failure, it's a tremendous failure, um, an incredible cost burden. So pharma ended up saying, you know, we'll let the, the academic institutions and the small businesses of the world figure out some of these harder problems. And we'll effectively end up, um, you know, buying out those organizations or whatever the case may be downstream. Sorry, one second. Uh, 45 minutes. Can you ask Kim? Kim had put me in here. Do you mind? Yeah, sorry. Excellent. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So in continuing, um, I met Ted Bryce and Greg Dussor, um in the fall of 2014. Um, uh, effectively, what was happening is I was about a year and a half away from finishing my PhD in biomedical engineering. Um, and I guess I was, I was bored or hungry or something. And I decided, look, I'm gonna start bouncing around and start looking for a handful of really smart individuals that have some good science that would potentially give me a shot at helping develop that science. Um, it, the part of our story is really funny. I, I went to a mentor of mine who told me that Ted and Greg were on campus and no joke and, and uh, no exaggeration. I literally went and walked over to their offices, which were right next door to each other. And I knocked on both of their doors and I said, hey, are you Dr. Price and Dr. DeSore? Yes, yes. Uh, I'd like to sit down with the two of you and have a conversation about how the three of us could turn your ideas in, into a potential organization. Uh, the three of us sat down that day uh, and had a, a very long and detailed conversation, which effectively said, look, we're going to give this a shot. And we're going to pitch it in some business idea competitions, one of which was coming up uh, here at UT Dallas. Um, and if it's a good business idea and we all feel good about the business relationship, we'll start an organization. And if not, you know, we'll all go right back to what we were doing. Uh, the original business plan was to commercialize in a really interesting way an over-the-counter over analgesic product use those revenues to offset the need for equity financing into our pharmaceutical product through FDA clinical trials and, and sort of abviate the need um, to actually raise the, the normal amount of funding that we would typically have to do. I'll get into that story a little bit later, um, but effectively what happened was we went to the UT Dallas uh, business idea competition and we won uh, coincidentally first and third place, which is an interesting story. Um, and then we went uh, to a number of different business idea competitions around the country, including uh, sponsored by UTD, the, the California Dreaming competition on our behalf, as well as a number of others. By the time it was all said and done, we were, we were very close to probably 100,000 in non-dilutive sort of business, business idea money. 
and the three of us sat down. I still remember uh, here in Richardson or Plano, the the flying saucer. We were having a couple of beers, and we decided, yes, this sounds like a good idea. Why don't Why don't we take a stab at turning this thing in, into a business? And so, uh, Cersei Therapeutics was effectively born that day. As I mentioned, we had started a separate organization or, or a concurrent organization uh, under the same umbrella called Ted's Brain Science Products, which was an over-the-counter uh, analgesic product that we intended to sort of roll into and help us fund some of our early uh, development programs. Um, what ended up being the case, and as a lesson to anybody doing um, a, a new co, uh, the investor body but interested in one company was not the same as the investor body interested in the other. So very early on, we decided it made a lot of sense to separate the two organizations. But as a plug to that company, uh, Ted's Brain Science Products is still alive and uh, doing well. Uh, they have a website uh, that's tedsbrainscienceproducts.com um, and is a fantastic over-the-counter analgesic product that would compete with the uh, lidocaines um, and icy hots of the world. Uh, just very proud that we were able to do that concurrent with starting uh, Cersei Therapeutics. So through that, Cersei Therapeutics was born. Um, effectively, we founded Cersei uh, back in February of 2015. We typically say that Cersei was really born in the summer of 2016. Um, effectively, what ended up happening was we started with one pharmaceutical target that we were really interested in uh, called the adenosine monophosphate kinase activators and AMK activators, uh, which is not material to the story, only that it wasn't the ultimate target that we ended up um, uh, developing. So we were developing one product or type of product. Um, and about a year and a half after founding the organization, I had finished my PhD and I had gone to work for the organization full time under the guise of a a uh, postdoc actually through Ted and Greg laboratory uh, for a short stint. And we just had this unique opportunity where a pharmaceutical company where our chief scientific officer, Scott Dax, uh, had previously worked called Galleon Pharmaceuticals was looking to offload some of their uh, science. Um, we went up very aggressively and in about two or three weeks had uh, outright acquired this particular program uh, from an organization that just didn't see the value in it. Um, at the time they were developing breathing control modulators to prevent opioid induced respiratory depression. And we were interested in this particular product as a standalone analgesic product. And uh, our intention was to acquire the product, basically fill out the indication profile, which means what are we gonna use this pharmaceutical product for, right? So we were interested in acute post-surgical pain, neuropathic pain or chronic pain, uh, particularly diabetic uh, nerve pain, um, as well as osteoarthritis and a number of others. And then we really liked the idea of it for other indications that we just didn't have the bandwidth uh, to develop it for. Um, I won't belabor this part of the story. Um, there are pain medications uh, available and on the market and not all of them are opioids, right? But the problem is, they all do have fundamental problems with the way they work and act, right? Which is typically true of every pharmaceutical product. Um, they all function a little differently. Um, and the problem is in our particular belief, um, some of these products are really good at alleviating pain. Most of them that are non-opioid non in nature don't alleviate the pain in a way that's one, consistent, and two, really safe enough to just be widely distributed. And so, this is sort of where we started was let's look at this side effect profile associated with the current standards of care uh, that the drugs on the market currently have. And is there a way to create a product where you could have pain relief, even if it's less pain relief than say an opioid analgesic? Um, and is there a way to create a product that has pain relief, but then doesn't have either any of these side effects or potentially much less of them, and, and certainly not to the degree that these uh, these have. And so uh, I see there's some comments here. Um, so let me make sure none of them are questions, maybe. Is there a way to do that? Oh, thanks. We got Greg weighing in. I love it. All right, I'm gonna continue moving. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is, this is sort of where we started. We just, as an organization, started taking our first steps. Um, as a background to me, uh, I really was and am a scientist by training. 
Um, I started taking management classes here at the university while finalizing and finishing my PhD. Uh, but frankly, I didn't have a background in that. And, uh, you know, I'm not a finance guy uh, by training and I've never had any formal training there other than a handful of classes. However, what I would say to most people who really have a strong desire for entrepreneurship is there's just no, uh, there is no training required, right? Entrepreneur and entrepreneurs, right, by definition are people who are self-starters who are going to teach themselves what they need to learn and move forward and or find the right set of people who are going to help them and answer questions for them and work with them to be able to build that, that skill set. So um, as someone like Greg on this uh, call could tell you, um, a lot of this was making mistakes and learning from those mistakes and trying to find uh, the next step forward. So we sort of characterize this as either a baby or sometimes these days characterize it as someone who's just drunk. Uh, you want to walk a straight line and you just cannot do it. So sometimes you fall down and crawl and sometimes you, you wobble all over the place. But the, 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 real, the real message I would tell to anybody who's interested in doing something like this is it's a, it's a function of taking that next step. Um, it's not a function of taking the right next step. It's the function of taking the next step. Because if it's the wrong step, now you know that's not the next step. And you keep going. But it's a, it's a fail fast type mentality. And I think that's one of the things that made... Uh, Cersei really successful. So now we come to the story of why it's Cersei versus Cersei. So I, I add this just because it's a funny story and something our team uh, all gets a kick out of. When we sat down to name uh, our organization, uh, we had a very small group of people involved in that process. And we said, look, we're going to create a, a company here. We want the name to be short, uh, just because we did. Um, we want it to be catchy. We want to be able to say it out loud and have people be able to write it down. We want to be able to write it down and have people say it out loud. We fundamentally failed on all of these parts. Uh, Circe is the goddess of potions and magic in Greek mythology. So we thought if you took the two words cerebral and science and just slammed them together, and it created Circe, and it's not spelled this way, obviously, uh, then we could create this really catchy name of the goddess of potions and magic for a pharmaceutical company. This, at the time, was during the Game of Thrones, I'll call it a pandemic, because it was just as widely utilized as, unfortunately, this ongoing pandemic that we're dealing with. Um, but uh, Game of Thrones was a big deal. I was not a fan or knew much about it. Uh, it turns out Cersei Lannister is like one of the most evil villains of TV history, apparently. And so as we continued working through trying to fundraise and get the name out there and market for our organization, we found the need to sort of rebrand ourselves from Cersei Therapeutics to Cersei Therapeutics, which is probably phonetically the right way to say it anyways. As just an additional sort of tweak to our failure here in naming our company, uh, our compound that we ended up developing and ultimately selling to Acadia was peripherally restricted, meaning it doesn't really get into the central nervous system. So there is no cerebral component. So on and on and on, we just did a really poor job naming our company and it's kind of funny. So we ultimately ended up referring to it as Sir Psy Therapeutics, but I like Cersei better, and, and now that we've sold it, we, we go back to Cersei. So um, this is really where I tell the story of, it's not a one trick pony, right? It's not a one man show here. Um, there, not everybody who was associated or had anything to do with our organization is on here. Uh, it, you know, Ted and Greg are not shown here. One of our operating guys is not on here. A number of our consultants are not on here. But if you just throw a really brief picture of some of the people that we had to interact with to be able to get this organization started, um, you can see that it's not just people, but it's institutions and organizations. Uh, we had a really rich sort of backstory where we, we got to meet a lot of our board. And I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but Brent Duncan, David Hitt, and Dennis Robbins were all associated with the university in one way or another. And I ended up meeting at one of the business idea competitions that we ultimately ended up winning. And they ended up being instrumental parts of our organization uh, and members of our board, as well as very material investors in our company. Pat Conflone was a dear friend of our CSO, uh, Scott Dax. Uh, Pat is one of the most recognized uh, medicinal chemists in the entire world. Uh, so to be able to have him even standing next to me in this picture at the time was just a huge feat uh, for a small biotech that had really at the time no funding. Uh, coincidentally, we are standing in front of the ROC building at the VDC here. 
Um, a number of consultants, people like Nora Volchkow of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, people like Hubert Zajacek of Health Wildcatters, uh, as well as you know, the UT design team and everybody on this call you know, who had anything to do with our company, our partners for our clinical trials, um, you know, the Bio, uh, Bio International uh, Organization. And then, and then really, I, I, I drop in about Ingrid Bavaria here from Interlock Partners um, into the slide as a, as a special thanks and as a story um, sort of precipitator uh, for really networking, right? You never know who you're going to meet or what they're going to do f either for you, or with you, or how they're going to influence uh, your life or organization. I met Inabot at a wedding in Marble Falls. Uh, she was a friend of one of my best friends who was getting married and she was there with her husband. Um, and we were just all kind of talking because we were all part of the wedding party. And it turned out that one of their LPs was an individual named David Jenikov, who's right here. And one of his partners was a guy named John Harkey. David and John were the original co-founders of a storage facility, which ultimately turned into a gene therapy company called Avexis Pharmaceuticals, which two years ago sold for north of $8 billion. And so they started putting some of that money to work. Um, and when I found out, and I had been looking for David for a while, because his background and mine were fairly similar, both studying bone biology, and biochemistry. Um, and I was looking for an introduction to this individual. And it actually is impossible to get in, introduced to these people usually. And what ended up happening was, as an LP of, of her fund, uh, I ended up requesting her to send a, a slide deck to David. She did so, and two weeks later, he was in our office and a month later, uh, he was the lead investor of our company. Um, so for whatever it's worth, just as a, a side story there, you really need to make sure you, you, you take careful consideration for who you're spending time with and how you're doing that and making sure that these people are, are you know, carefully uh, taken care of, right? So these, these people mattered a lot in our early days and matter a lot still today. Um, and just can't thank, can't thank people like Inabot enough uh, for, for their involvement. Uh, I'll briefly introduce our team because I think it's important. I already mentioned Scott Dack. Scott was an analgesic research, analgesic research team lead at Johnson & Johnson for a number of years. Ended up going to work for a company called Galleon Pharmaceuticals, as I mentioned. We ended up recruiting him away from there um, and, uh, and ultimately became our chief scientific officer. And it was his science that we ended up ultimately developing. Marco Papagallo was our chief medical officer. He was a Mount Sinai and and Albert Einstein uh, uh, individual um, had been involved with a number of biotechs, including Novo Pharmaceuticals, who was acquired by Grudenthal Therapeutics. Uh, there's nobody in the pain space who doesn't know Marco. So him being picked up was a huge testament uh, to, to our organization as well. Greg Dyer was our vice president of finance and business development. Eugene Garza was our operations manager. And then between me and this audience, I, I still believe uh, Teresa Burns probably the, the most important pickup of our entire uh, team development. She was our director of clinical operations. And without her, we would have been just a bunch of babies trying to develop this thing through the clinic. None of us had clinical experience and she came in as a total rock star and really reshaped our entire organization. Uh, we had a very strong board. I've introduced most of these individuals already. Um, but I will mention uh, Tyler Browse because he's not been mentioned. Uh, he's a, another one of our major investors um, and was a part of our transactional committee who ended up helping us get the, get the, uh, the, the deal over the finish line. Let's see. So this is a poor attempt of showing a, a schematic for how these things started. Um, but again, due to some confidentiality issues, uh, it's probably the the best opportunity I have to be able to kind of walk through everybody's sort of this timeline. Um, and, and I say it because there's not usually a lot of pharmaceutical companies, one, out of the North Texas area, uh, but two, that are capable of moving quite as quickly as we did. And you'll see that, as I mentioned, I met Ted and Greg back in 2014, but we really didn't start development of this particular program until the summer of 2016. Uh, we won some business idea competitions, as I mentioned. Uh, in January and February, we started recruiting our board of directors and team. Uh, March was when we brought in Scott, which was about a year before we ended up acquiring our, our technology, a year, year and a half. 
Um, and it was in April that we started synthesizing our in primary screening uh, all of our AMK compounds, which again, we ended up sort of, I don't want to say deprioritizing, but pivoting and deprioritizing that program uh, to, so that our uh, you know, lead program could take precedent. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the Vivek Murthy here in the bottom left ended up in, uh, I guess that was 2015, 2016 had his call to action. And then it was later that year and in, in the next year, actually 2017, that the president ended up declaring a national emergency and, a you know, put together a task force for task force for the opioid epidemic. I mentioned that because it was uh, important to our organization. At the time, we were just a biotech company trying to do something that a lot of other people weren't doing. But we'd been doing it for about two years prior to all of this media attention. And so we were just ahead of the game. And sometimes it's just right place, right time. And for our particular organization, I, I will credit a little bit of luck there. You take luck when you get it. Uh, we were lucky that we were doing this prior to those announcements and that we had a leg up by the time it happened. Um, as I mentioned, in 2016 is when we acquired, um, and I can point here, when we acquired our technology, uh, negotiated and ultimately acquired in August uh, of 2016. Coincidentally, and again, you can't make these things up, it just happened to be another August of 2020 when we ultimately sold our company. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that here in a moment. Um, I ended up I say quit my postdoc. I'll rub it in to Greg a little bit. I was it was technically the first job I was ever fired from, uh, but I was I was technically fired to be able to start this, which was fantastic. And and you know again we were all part of that decision. It was fantastic and it was really exciting uh, to be able to formally say, no, I don't want to be on the science side of this, and I am going to learn the business, and I am gonna I'm gonna position myself to be a, a business executive uh, in this new co. Um, and really at the time it was just that broad. I didn't actually take the CEO role for another year uh, when our board uh, voted me into it after we raised our first equity financing. Um, so you can see here, that's when we sort of got started. Uh, we began validation of our program and started looking at all the indications that it could be effective in. Uh, we started fundraising sort of, I say, I, it, it says here in May, we really started like February, March of that year and started making some traction, but it wasn't until the summer of that year that we had identified our, our uh, investors um, and had decided to go ahead and take on an equity financing round. So we, we raised $4 million in equity financing um, while coupling that with about a $2 million grant from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So credit to, um, it says NID, it's NIDA grant. Um, credit to uh, the government and the National Institute of Health. They really did put their money where their mouth was as it relates to this epidemic um, and were a strong partner to us all the way through uh, the, the, the story of our organization. And it was sort of later in 2017, really early 2018, when we decided to commence our IND, which is the investigational new drug application uh, of our program, which is what you need to have the FDA approve you to actually start clinical trials. Um, and frankly, not a lot of pharmaceutical companies even get to the IND stage. Um, and just credit to really our science team, we did it in about 18 months, uh, which was a huge feat um, and got the attention of a, a lot of people. January 2018 was when we started going to the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference. This was an unpopular decision by a lot of our team, uh, only because it's an expensive endeavor um, and a lot of you know, biotechs would never do this. I think it had a lot to do uh, with our eventual networking, which led to our success um, in the pharmaceutical world. Uh, so we ended up doing it every year thereafter. Uh, CMC rounding out, tox commence, IND prep was all part of our investigational new drug application, uh, which we ultimately ended up having our, our in-person FDA meeting in September of that year, completed our IND towards the end of the year, filed it in January and had it accepted and approved by February. So again, just really quick turnaround for all of this particular work. Uh, huge credit to the FDA as well. A lot of people think and characterize the FDA as a detriment to development. Um, I would characterize it the opposite. I think uh, they're a very well uh, developed organization. They're calculated and they're really in the interest of public health. Um, and so they're a partner, uh, not a detriment, and they should be viewed that way. Um, later in, uh, later, right after our IND, we ended up needing additional funding. So we did two more funding rounds, which ended up rounding out to $12 million. 
in funding. So coupled with uh, our original four, once we were done with all the grant funding that we ended up ultimately getting, we ended up raising about $20 million for our organization, somewhere between 20 and 25. Um, we're fortunate uh, that we had the right kind of investors to where uh, it really is sort of a, a a, a window of numbers like that. I should know the actual number, but we were just so fortunate in our ability to be able to fundraise around this project uh, that when we needed money, we were able to go acquire it. So it really is a function of just having the right people who believe in, in, the, in the program and the project uh, to be able to make sure that they can stay in. I think of our entire investor body, everyone who invested once invested again. Right? We didn't have anybody who said, oh, I don't believe it anymore. I can't do it anymore. I don't want to do it anymore. Uh, so just a huge testament to, to our investors, 90% um, of whom are in the North Texas area and or Texas area in general. Uh, so we did have money from South Texas and Central Texas and North Texas, a little bit that came out of Minnesota. Um, but in general, uh, we had uh, Texas-based investors, which was fantastic. Um, and we also never had to raise money from the venture capital community. It was all high net worth individuals and family offices, which provided our organization the latitude to be able to operate our company the way we saw fit in the very early days of the organization, which ultimately proved to be very important. More than that, it gave us the latitude to negotiate a sale of our organization without the needs of a venture uh, community uh, that typically you know, has its, its own needs and wants. And so it can be a little bit more difficult. So we were, we were fortunate to be able to have that kind of latitude. So again, just in, in staying with this story and moving quickly, you know, we raised $12 million that March. Um, so that line, yeah, is actually over here in March. We raised this 12 million in March, uh, started our clinical conduct by April, May of that year. We had our first patient dosed with our product uh, June of 2019. We had finished our first single ascending dose clinical trial, safety and tolerability by December of that year. Uh, and at that December, we started our food effect as well as our multiple ascending dose and ultimately ended up rounding out a subsequent $4 million fundraising round uh, for our organization, which actually closed that next March. Um, so again, I, I sort of stopped the story there. All of this is uh, historical, so I, I, I won't show any of this, but I will go back and talk about sort of that last year, right? So there's some confidentiality associated with the 2020 piece, um, but effectively what happened was we were raising a 50, five, zero million dollar B round. And, and the intention was to really blow up our organization, get it ready for a public offering. Um, we were excited about the opportunity to do that. We were excited about all of the safety aspects of the, of the, of the compound, uh, of which I can't mention, but uh, what I can say is under our guidance, we never saw a, uh, a safety side effect of any kind, which is really impressive. Um, and one of the things that got uh, the attention of our ultimate partner. Um, what ended up happening was we decided to do what's called a dual track system where we were evaluating uh, interested parties for mergers and acquisition and or licensing uh, while concurrently raising our B round. We had no idea COVID was gonna impact uh, either our studies or our organization. But we were very fortunate to be virtual. As you saw, our team was a full-time team of six at the largest that we ever got. Two of those individuals were not even hired until the last year of the organization. And for the first two and a half years of the organization, three years of the organization, we were really a full-time team of two with really strong scientific advisors and a board of directors. Um, so started raising this $50 million round. Of course, that was going to come from these blue chip venture groups. Um, started flying all over the country, uh, really building out those airline miles um, and status, uh, which is both good and bad for anybody who has it. Um, and really the idea internally was we had no intention to sell the organization. We thought we had a lot more life in it. And we really were excited about where we were headed with it. Um, what ended up ultimately happening was this particular partner that we ended up partnering with ended up showing a strong enough interest in our organization that we thought that under their guidance, um, and with their particular budget and uh, in size, that they would be able to do things with our program that we ultimately wouldn't be able to do. Additionally, from just a business perspective, we, we ended up being able to exit our organization, provide our investors with a return on that initial investment, while also engineering the deal such that uh, there were downstone, lots of downstream milestone payments and, and, and royalties associated with the acquisition that 
effectively gives our investors an opportunity to have their cake and eat it too. Now the investment on their end is totally de-risked and they have an opportunity to share in all of the upside as we move forward. So it ended up being a really great model um, and frankly was the original model that we were intending to, to, uh, to establish, albeit uh, probably 18 or 24 months later, uh, that, or we did it 18 or 24 months uh, earlier than we had initially uh, intended. Uh, so just as a quick uh, sort of overview of all of this, right? Uh, 044 was discovered in 2009. Uh, Galleon was developing it till about 2014. It sat on a shelf until uh, 2016, really. We acquired Scott in 2015. We acquired the program in 2016. We validated the, uh, the preclinical package uh, between 2016 acquisition and the summer of 17, which is when we took our first equity financing. Um, 20, by 2018, we had initiated our IND program. By 2019, we had, a, had received approval of that uh, program. By the end of 19, we had not only initiated, but finished our first clinical trial. And by the summer of 2020, we had finished our entire phase one safety and tolerability study program. Uh, and had also completely negotiated uh, for the acquisition of our organization by Acadia Pharmaceuticals. So very fast timeline. Um, and again, just credit to our team, uh, really smart people uh, on our side of the table uh, that just, you know, for some reason were letting, letting me steer the ship. So I, I, had the, I had the easy job and they really had the hard job. So again, just huge testament to our team, uh, not to, not, certainly not to myself. Um, this, is, this is not... Uh, this is, I, I'm not speaking on behalf of uh, the new organization that's running our organization or our program. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of what we were looking at when we were still running uh, CT044. And this is really where we were at at the time that the acquisition took place. We were moving into phase two for the development of the asset for post-surgical pain. We were bringing up chronic pain uh, indications uh, that were just behind it only because of a de-risking uh, interest of this being a little bit easier to do in the clinic than, than chronic pain. We additionally had, at the time that we sold, I can't, unfortunately can't tell you how many, but we had a very large library of active analogs or other compounds that were showing activity. Um, and we were developing them not only for chronic pain, but for migraine under the guidance of, of Greg, who, who ended up through this science and, and through uh, partnerships with ourselves and through his laboratory, received a, a number of different migraine grants uh, on this science to develop this. And so that, that hopefully will continue. Um, and then additionally, neurodegenerative disease as well as opiate use disorders. Uh, this is just a plug to really everybody who was a part, um, and this is not certainly not everybody, but to a lot of the big players who were part of our success in being able to make this acquisition occur. One, I always credit the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference because it was at that conference um, and through our attendance of that conference over three years, uh, that we ended up having the ability to network for, meet these pharma companies, and ultimately end up finding a partner. That's where we found Acadia. Uh, frankly, they found us, uh, which, which was great. Uh, I will credit the, the uh, attorneys who were involved, uh, which not everyone would do, but we both sets, our attorney as well as the Acadia set of attorneys, Scadden and Paul Hastings, instrumental in the success of these negotiations, as well as our, our investment banking teams, Evercore, and uh, the Bank of America Merrill Lynch teams, um, both of which had each other's backs uh, and our backs, ours as well as Acadia's. It was a great, great experience in the negotiation. Um, I'd like to credit the Acadia team. Um, uh, Stephen Davis was absolutely instrumental in, in getting this over the finish line, as, as was Mark Schneier, their, uh, their uh, chief business officer. Uh, someone not represented here is Isaac Weinbergs, who actually ended up leaving Acadia to start his own organization after our acquisition was completed. Uh, so Libra Life Sciences is, is now up and running, um, as well as the science team, uh, Dr. DeBar and Dr. Salinas. Um, as, a, as a coincidence, again, you never know who you're talking to, Elysio Salinas here in the middle right was actually one of our first uh, uh, candidates to take uh, the position of chief medical officer uh, at Circe Therapeutics. Um, it ended up not being a right, right fit or right timing, um, but right after we interviewed him, he ended up taking the position as the uh, chief scientific officer 
at Acadia and ended up being the internal champion for the acquisition of our, our organization and program. So again, you never know who, who you're talking to. Uh, I think that marketing is uh, definitely important to an extent, uh, as well as having strong partnerships. So I won't go through all of these people, but um, huge thanks and kudos to everyone who picked up our story and had any interest in hearing our story, both then and now and, and moving forward. Uh, but getting the name out there of, of an uh, organization is important because otherwise it's really difficult to have people even know who you are. Um, in closing here, these are things everybody's ever always heard. I, I don't put this little schematic here on the right up uh, uh, on accident, right? Good things come to those who wait is absolutely not true. Good things come to those who work their asses off and never give up. We made a lot of mistakes at Cersei Therapeutics. It was not a flawless effort. Um, you know, it, 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 was, it was frankly an effort where it was mistake after mistake after mistake, and it was just people being willing to learn from those mistakes and move forward. So it really was, as I mentioned, you know, either a baby walk or a drunk walk, just keep taking the step. I couldn't advocate for our team strong enough. Um, a lot of people are, are a little reluctant on giving away things like common stock equity in the beginning. I don't think we are here today if we hadn't have been really in my opinion, generous for how we did that because we wouldn't have been able to recruit the people who ultimately ended up being involved. Because uh, frankly, you know, I was nobody and, and it, you know, people, people gave us a chance and we ended up having one of the strongest pharmaceutical teams in biotech uh, by the time we ended up uh, closing the organization. Um, <clears throat> there's gonna be hard days, prepare for them, expect them, endure them and just place them in the, in the box of bad days, that's fine. Um, I won't go through all of these, but yeah, you know, find things to do with your time, exercise your body. I, I tried to read everything when I first got started, coach yourself and, and it's not a sprint, right? Don't burn out. You know, we moved really quickly. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, you, you, every now and then we had to unplug and we did things, you know, to kind of blow off some steam as, as a team and as individuals. So, um, it was a great experience and, and we learned a lot from it. Uh, these are all sort of cliche things, but I think that these actually, uh, are particularly important and true. Uh, and a couple of quotes, just because we can, right? So great things in business are never done by one person, they're done by a team of people. Um, that's absolutely true. At the end, by the end of the organization, absolutely is true. You could have removed me from my role as CEO, put, it, put another competent person in that role, not changed any part of our team other than that role, um, and I believe we still would have been successful. So it really was about building the right team. It was not about having the right leader. Um, this group of people gets a second slide here because they were the group of people that got this thing over the finish line for us. You, again, you could remove me from that role, keep these people where they were at. And I still believe we would have been successful. That's true of our board as well. <clears throat> again, more team, 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 you know, building it's like a, a home, the foundation's what matters. Again, another huge testament, not only to our, our sort of operational board, but as well as our investor board of directors. We just had a really strong group of people uh, by the time this thing was over. And again, just, I, I, I really do believe, and again, this is a little cliche to say, but Dallas really is primed uh, to, to have a strong footprint in the biotech pharma space. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave this up here uh, while we talk or ask questions, but um, effectively, I, I think that we're making the right strides you know, the, the Pegasus Park here on the left with partnerships of UT Dallas, UT Southwestern, um, as well as uh, the Lida Hill Philanthropies. You know, th I think that we're in a good position. We're right in the middle of the country. We're a three hour flight from the West Coast. We're a three hour flight from the East Coast. If you're in New York and, or Boston and doing a biotech, it's all day to be able to get over to the other side of the country, right? So I think that, that the American Airlines and DFW Airport really provide an opportunity uh, for this. And so uh, anybody who's interested in this, I think that this is a really good time to do it. And frankly, there's a lot of investment uh, coming in the North Texas area. So with that, I'll say thank you. And uh, I'll, I'm open to answer questions here for the next few minutes, but also um, I'm going to stay on for y'all's networking session. So happy to answer questions there as well. Well, thank you very much, Lucas. And, and I know you can't hear it, but there's a tremendous amount of virtual applause here among our, our audience. Uh, so I, I heard several questions from people who are very early in their career and don't yet have a startup active and, and would like your advice on how to, uh, how to get started thinking about it almost. Someone maybe is a student at, at a university in the area. And so uh, maybe you could describe a little about what you'd recommend the steps they take. Yeah, I think that if, you know, 
as, as it relates to starting the organization or as it relates to finding an idea? Um, I think they need both, but I'd say starting an organization. Yeah, so the, the trick to starting an organization is starting it, period, full stop. Um, a lot of people ask, that's usually one of the first questions people have is how do you, you know, what was the first step to actually get the organization started? It, it really was uh, either one, if you're confident in being able to do it yourself, um, you know, you can just get online at State of Texas or State of Delaware and you can file all the appropriate paperwork to get your organization up and running. And there's some things that you won't know about is, you know, how do you authorize shares of the organization and give yourself equity as well as give other people equity. Typically, and I'll speak for myself on this, but, you know, typically there's people, you know, now like me, but at the time, like my advisors and mentors who will do this for free. If they're looking for an equity position in your new co to be able to teach you how to start a new co, they're the wrong people. Um, so you should be able to ask your network, whether it's your parents, family, friends, people like me, you feel free to link LinkedIn with me and shoot me a note. I'm happy to point you in the right direction. Um, but there's a lot of people like that who are willing, willing to help out. So what I would say is just be motivated to do it, ask the right questions. If you don't have the money to do it, you can typically, and again, doing it yourself is, I mean, hundreds of dollars to start a company, right? It's very easy. Um, but, you know, frankly, there's even a lot of attorneys that will do this for free, right? They'll, you'll just say, look, I want to start a company. I'm going to try to raise some money around it. A lot of people would just do that part of it for you, hand it over to you, and then let you, and then expect you to, right? That's a relationship that they built, and they're going to help you. They expect you to come back to them after you raise the money. So really, no joke, the the answer to the question of how do you start a company is you just have to start it, right? If you're talking about it and all this other stuff for years and years, it'll never happen. How do you find an idea? There's a lot of opportunity there too, right? So a lot of it can be, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of great science at academic institutions that have trouble being advanced after a certain point. So you could go to a tech transfer department, shoot them an email and ask them uh, to be able to take a look at the science involved um, since selling uh, Cersei, I've been in contact uh, and in deep diligence with Northwestern, Vanderbilt, Johns Hopkins, Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, I happen to have a background in this now, uh, but they would do that for anyone, right? That's just what they do. Uh, so they'll share that information with you. Um, outside of that, there's lots of places to go. Um, Health Wildcatters is a good example where people are starting companies, pitching those ideas and trying to raise money and find teams. Uh, but Y Combinator and all the other ones out there in the world are doing this as well. The, there's one at Harvard, there's four on the West Coast, there's a lot. Um, and additionally, a lot of these angel network areas, right? So those are a little bit more difficult to get in front of, uh, but you, there's a handful of uh, angel networks here in the state. You can usually email somebody, even if you're not an angel investor, and just say, hey, I, I want the slide decks from your, from your pitches that you had over the last however long. And you'll be surprised at a lot of people who are trying to raise money and are unsuccessful at it and are looking for smart people and or hand over the asset and let you move on. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a heavy lift. There's a lot of work involved in that part of the organization. You can't just do it, right? You got to do it and do it for a while and really, really be motivated to do it. But, but these opportunities are available if you're, if you're willing to work for it. Well, terrific. So it is just two minutes before one o'clock, which ends the formal start time of our session. So um, all of you out there, again, join me in the virtual applause for, for Lucas and in thanking him for being here with us today. Uh, we are going to continue for another half an hour uh, um, or in, until Lucas has to depart, I guess. Think of this as the moral equivalent of going up and speaking with the person at the front of the room uh, after the session ends. And um, I think I think we probably have a small enough group actually that if you would like to, you may have a raise your hand capability. If you do, please do that. Um, if you don't, you know, let's see if we can make it work. Just uh, Mallory, if you give us the ability for people to unmute themselves and, uh, you know, turn on your mic, turn on your camera and let's, let's talk. While people are figuring out the, uh, the, details of yet another online meeting platform, you know, I uh, was really intrigued to hear, Lucas, something that, that I may have missed in our previous conversations about how heavily Texas 
uh, investors in particular, but also people uh, really played in what you're doing. Because as, as you said, people think oh, I have to go to Boston. And, uh, you know, is that a myth or is that something that's changing? What's going on? It's a myth. Yeah, it's a it's fundamentally a myth. Uh, it's not even a myth. It's just a lie. Um, uh, you know, Boston, Boston's had a really great track record, but there's also a lot of great scientists up there, right? That cannot be ignored, right? So the, the Harvard, you know, Cambridge area, the MIT, you know, there's just a lot of smart people up there developing a lot of really great science. But if somebody out of Dallas flew up to Boston and wanted to license a Harvard technology, they absolutely could. You don't have to be a Harvard graduate to get a Harvard technology. You don't have to be a Harvard graduate to hire somebody from Harvard, right? Just ask McKinsey, right? They hire all the Harvard graduates. So, you know, the, the answer is there's a lot of smart people up there in that part of the country, right? And so that part of the country has a really easy time recruiting those people to that part of the country. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of people one down here and two, a lot of this a lot of the science coming out of Texas ends up in the Northeast and on the West Coast because traditionally Texas hasn't invested um, monetarily in the development of those right. So what typically would happen is you'd have an organization like ours right that is unsuccessful at raising money, and they find a venture group, uh, you know BlackRock, RA. MCM, TPG, and EA, right? All of these big groups that are all over the country and they say, yes, we'll invest in you, but you have to move up here because they wanna be able to go drive down the street and see you and they don't wanna to have to take a flight to Texas to be able to see you. So frankly, what ends up happening is people have an inability to be able to raise the funding that they need to and they end up going to one of the coasts, particularly up in the Northeast. And so it looks like all the technology is coming out of there and it's not, you know, you go down to Houston and MD Anderson, Right, a lot of those cancer compounds that are being developed and cancer therapies that are being developed end up getting funded by the Northeast. So it looks like a, a New York, Philadelphia, Boston win, Connecticut win uh, when it's not. I'd say it's also a responsibility of the institutions that are developing those sciences, right? So uh, Yale is a great example, right? New Haven, Connecticut is this small. Um, but they have some really smart people there who end up graduating and end up wanting to develop sciences and Yale encourages that right so you have a tremendous amount of biotech coming out of Yale over the last 10 years. Um, but again, you know those don't those don't technically have to end up staying there. As a testament to our organization we started with a strong intention to be a Texas company right that was just that was just really stupidity on our behalf maybe but we just said, you know, hey, we're going to do this. And it was important to me. Uh, we could have raised our money and probably a lot more of it and a lot faster if we had gone to Philadelphia. Um, you know, over the last, the last three years of the organization, I spent 27 weeks out of the year in Philadelphia um, just because that's where a lot of our work happened and where a lot of our people were. Um, but it was important for me to, you know, we can do the work anywhere in the country and anywhere, anywhere in the world. But it was really important for me that the money came from Texas so that we could keep our company here in Texas and our headquarters was here uh, all five years. And so for us, that was important. Um, it's not just us, right? You have Peloton, uh, Riata, uh, ZS Pharma had a huge uh, acquisition, Avexis had a huge acquisition. Um, there's a lot of these organizations in the Texas area. And if you look at just the North Texas area over the last five years, there's been like four, there's been one big giant acquisition in the biotech pharmaceutical area every year over the last five or six years. So I really do believe Texas has the ability to do this. Really the, the, the stopgap is the funding, right? So it's at the responsibility of the people writing the checks uh, to be able to, you know, to help do this, right? And to take chances on Texas companies. Um, and to that end, I'll plug uh, an Austin-based company that's getting more and more involved in this is Sante Ventures, who I've been talking to over the last uh, few months. Um, it seems like they're getting much more active. And I mentioned Libra uh, Life Sciences. Um, they were a big investor of, uh, of that organization. So again, it, it's happening. I, I don't want to say it's happening uh, slowly, but it's, it's definitely happening, right? It's, not, it's just not at the magnitude that some of these other places are. But but frankly, nobody's gonna catch up to a Boston, right? Or even frankly, a San Diego or San Francisco at this point, they're just gonna be different, right? And Palo Alto is always gonna be the tech guys. Boston's always gonna be a biotech group. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that there's not room in that community for a lot of other, uh, a lot of other development and players. Yeah, very good. So uh, we do have a, a uh, someone standing in wait to ask you a question live. And so uh, Julie Johnson, do you want to unmute and, and activate your camera and let, let's see what you have to say? Yeah, sure. Uh, Lucas, thanks so much for the presentation. Uh, again, Julie Johnson from HomeCap and fellow Baylor Bears, so Sikkim. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of interested to hear what's next for you. You know, you've exited the company. Um, you know, what does that look like? Uh, post exit for you and you know moving forward after having built this for you know x amount of years yeah so it turns out that's a question everybody asked that i was unprepared and have always been unprepared to answer um you know what and, and the problem the probably the reason for that is i was i was so afraid this wasn't going to happen right I, up to the very end we were signing we were signing papers to close our deal at four o'clock in the morning on Monday morning, or I guess it was technically Tuesday morning at that point. And I stayed up until nine o'clock central to be able, or I guess it was 10 o'clock central to hear, uh, right, the ticker on MSNBC announced that it actually closed, right, and actually see the, the filing notices. So I, I was so afraid it wasn't going to happen. It was one of those things where you don't pick your head up or look over your shoulder until it's done. And so I, I was really intentional about not having anything waiting in the wind. Um, I will say that I've, I've absolutely fundamentally fallen in love with technology development. Um, I built out a really strong team of people. Um, I do believe that the model that we created um, at Cersei is, is replicatable. And I think it's something we could do again. So one thing, as I mentioned, I'm doing a lot of diligence right this minute on a number of pharmaceutical assets around the country. Um, one of the ones uh, was having a meeting here uh, in the UT Dallas area today, which is why I'm, I'm up here today. Um, so I'm having a lot of conversations to find out whether or not I can find another asset that we'd like to start a company around. Um, and additionally, having conversations with uh, sort of individual by individual, organization by organization about whether or not there's interest in utilizing either my skill set or our, or our team's skill set, so we we got to know the venture community pretty well, uh, particularly in this case up in the Northeast um, over the last uh, you know 18 months or so. Uh, so we've been having uh, I say we I'm so used to saying we so I've been having you know a lot of conversations with those types of groups about whether there's interest in in uh, utilization of my type of efforts. Um, but frankly, my heart is in entrepreneurship, and I think that if we could find another uh, opportunity to be able to replicate this, uh, it'd be fantastic. And frankly, I think it'd be a lot easier the second time around. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, exciting and congrats. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well, thanks so much for bringing up that question, Julie. And uh, I think I'm going to put Paul Nichols on the spot for a moment. Paul, if, if we could get you to, to unmute and, and enable your video, because I know uh, there was a lot of biotech activity in the big idea competition yesterday. I wonder if you could give us a quick report out. Sure, sure. Lucas, it's good to see you. I can't imagine how busy you have been. <laughs> yeah, good to see you as well. Um, but yeah, so we had the big idea competition yesterday, and for the first time, we had UT Southwestern as a partner uh, with us. And we had Lyda Hill come in to be a, a guest speaker, and she talked about the new Pegasus Park development, which UTD and uh, UT Southwestern are going to have a joint partnership with, including the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. UT Southwestern wants us there to help train some of their folks. So it goes to what Lucas was talking about, how we have a lot of really good resources and a lot of the ingredients here to develop something really special. And I think as an indication of that, yesterday when we did our big idea competition, we had four uh, separate track awards, but the winner in each of those awards ended up being a biotech deal. That's great to hear. I mean, I think that again, right, one of, one of the, one of the, so one of the discrepancies I see here in the North Texas area and in other areas outside of like the Boston, New York, again, Connecticut, San Diego, San Francisco areas is sort of this disconnect between business and science or business and engineering, right? And so if you go to Harvard and you're an engineer, you're going to have an experience in business. You're going to have, they're going to make sure that that's part of your education, right? You just have to have it. Um, and, and I saw that that was, a, that was a discrepancy while I was in school. I'm aware that it's been rectified and is being rectified here at UT Dallas uh, to some degree for sure, right? In just these collaborative efforts and the ability for engineers and scientists to be able to even pitch in these idea competitions where, you know, years ago that wasn't the case, right? It was MBA students and undergraduate business students pitching and there was 
you know, you have the, the business school on one side of campus and you have the engineering and sciences on the other side of campus. And I really think it's, it's about integrating the two, right? Because in any organization, right, the guy running the company is not always the guy developing the science, right? You have a chief science, chief technology, chief operating, CEO, they're all different roles. And so I think it's really about integrating the two. And I think it's really important um, and kudos to UT Dallas and, and the entrepreneurship, uh, IIE, the entire, the entire business school here at UT Dallas for, for really, you know, just taking that to heart and really uh, giving that a shot. I'll also plug uh, UT Design, right? I believe if I'm not mistaken, Rod, that uh, you guys are now have at least some track where the engineers could do their own, uh, their own idea for their design project and things like that, which is, which is huge, right? Because you don't know who's going to be interested in these types of projects and who's going to want to do it and who's going to have a knack for it. Um, and so again, I, I think that we got really lucky and I, I hope that I hope that our story sort of paves a little bit of the way and makes it a little easier for some of these groups. But I think that I think that everyone in in the area is taking the right steps uh, to really shepherd all of that along and you can really see it. And again, you mentioned Lida again, she's for a long time has been a huge player uh, in the North Texas space to help shepherd a lot of these technologies, both from biotechnology and science, uh, all the way to shepherding woman-owned and minority-owned businesses as well, which I think is important. So if I could ask you a follow-up question on that. So you participated in the Big Idea Competition and won it about, I think, like five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. So how helpful was going, at, since you don't have a business background, how helpful was it to you to go through these competitions? Yeah, I think that, and, and frankly, my experience was probably a lot different than the way it is today, right? One, it was not the same monetary amount. It wasn't, it wasn't sort of done the same way it was uh, over the last few years that I've thankfully had an opportunity to participate by being uh, a, a judge at a couple of them, which is kind of nice. Um, so my experience was unique in that, you know, the business idea competitions and what, what I would tell, you know, somebody getting ready for one of those was my experience was, it was a lot like Shark Tank, right? Is like it, it, it was the same kind of feel, short pitch, clean up your act, get ready, answer questions, all of that kind of stuff, which was phenomenally important, particularly in the early days, right? It, it physically makes you put together a plan, makes you think of the questions you're gonna have to ask and makes you polish your elevator pitch for the most part. Um, what it was really important and instrumental in doing for myself and our team was we took the entire process to heart. I think, I think opportunities like that are, you get what you put in, which again is a cliche, but you really do. So as soon as we were done with the business idea competition, we leveraged what we learned to be able to refine our pitch to go to all the other ones. And one turned into two, turned into three, turned into five. And by the time we were done, we were really good at the pitch, but hadn't actually done anything, right? And so the very next step was to actually incorporate the company and get started. So for us, it, it was really important because it actually made you think through those things, put things on paper. Because what happens to a lot of people is they have an idea and it just stays an idea, right? They don't actually end up you know, doing anything with it. I would say the same thing is true, particularly in the science fields for grant funding. I'm not a huge fan of having to write grants, um, but I think it's important. We did a lot of that at Searcy and it's the same kind of exercise, right? If you're gonna write a grant, you basically have to look years into the future and say, this is what we're going to do with the money when we get it. You actually have to put it down on paper, right? And I think that was probably the most useful exercise was forcing people to actually go through the process. Um, and frankly, just it's a forced networking event as well, right? And so it's a, it's, it's a small group of people. And so it, it's a, it's a self sort of self filter, self limiting type opportunity. And I mean, for us, Frankly, the big idea competition was, uh, was one of the most important things we ended up doing. I think the, the year before us, who the winner was rollout. <clears throat> and I remember just frankly, uh, that one of the motivating factors for myself and our team when we started was, we're gonna raise more money than rollout within the first several years of our, of our company, despite being a year behind them or whatever the case was. And we ended up being in the VDC right next to them. And we were like, yeah, we're gonna do it. And it was a like, sort of internal competition a little bit. So. I, I think it's great because it, it really does it really does instill that competition, which I think is important, right? You you don't have to win the big idea competition to be able to be the best idea as well, right? So um, as an example, part of my story was I said that we ended up winning first and third in the business idea competition that year. I think it was I think it was 2014 that we did it, um, and Cersei got third place, not first. 
Um, so the first place idea was actually my research project that I happened to be uh, working on at the time. It was a synthetic bone cement that we were developing. And that one really was just an idea, right? So, you know, it was just one of those things that we were excited about. And we've since, uh, we've since developed that to, to its own uh, development process. But uh, Cersei was the third place idea. And I remember at the time we had this internal conversation as to whether or not we were doing the right thing. We said, no, it's okay that we got third place. We're gonna move forward with this one. We really like it. So you don't have to win first place for anybody who participated in the business competition and didn't win. That doesn't mean you didn't have a good idea. It just means you didn't win first place, which is, which is fine. Paul, thanks for, for bringing that point out. I know Melanie is eager to ask a question. So <laughs> if Melanie, if you'd step in, thanks. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, and hi, Lucas, congratulations on all of your success. I uh, noticed that you attributed a lot of your success to a combination of your team and a little bit of luck. And I was uh, curious as to what led you to hiring those key players in your team. Did you, you know, find them organically or did you use an executive search firm? And, you know, is that something that you would consider doing in the future if maybe you weren't as lucky as you were the first time around? Yeah, I think that's a great question, right? Is how do you find talent? Um, we ultimately ended up establishing towards the end, right? When we were getting ready to close our $50 million round, uh, at that point, we had we had started really involved conversations with a number of executive search firms, uh, particularly in the biotech space for sort of executive level searches uh, for people that we were either looking, um, positions we were looking to build out um, and or a handful of positions where we had at least one person who was thinking they might have to leave. Um, so we, we were starting to do some of that kind of work in a big way. Uh, you're right, I said luck, one of the big, lucky pieces for us was finding these people, right? So uh, myself, Greg Desor, and Ted Price as the original founders of the company had a network of business individuals, both personally as well as through the business idea competition. I met David Hitt, uh, who was our, for a long time, was our intellectual property attorney, uh, as well as ended up being one of our lead investors. David was one of the judges at our business idea competition. So that's how I met David. Uh, Brent Duncan was the director of the Venture Development Center, which I'm sitting in right now, um, and was a mentor and friend of mine. I had no idea that he was who he was when he wasn't at the Venture Development Center, and he also ended up being one of our four major investors. Um, so those two, certainly lucky, uh, they, they ended up bringing Dennis Robinson, who ended up being instrumental and ran our entire audit process uh, for our audit committee. Um, I, as I mentioned, uh, it, was, it was at a wedding uh, that I met a, uh, a, a venture partner of Interlock Partners that ended up introducing me to the other two of our major investors. Um, so that was uh, opportunistic. They, you know, they brought in a lot of people subsequent to that. I, I credit luck and humility, right? I think that you know, our ability to not think that we knew everything, right? From myself all the way down to the smallest person in our organization, it was always a function of asking questions, right? We, we just didn't know everything that we were doing. And so we asked. Um, when I recruited Scott Dax, it was because Greg Dussor and Ted Price had known him from a previous life. Uh, they actually all ended up doing, uh, Greg, correct me if I get this wrong, but they all did their PhDs and or postdocs under the same PI. Um, not all at the same time, right? So it was just one of these things where they all just kind of knew who each other were and they were friends uh, with the same people. And so they said, hey, we know a medicinal chemist. Why don't you give this guy, Scott Dax, a call? Um, and I called Scott and he was like, well, why is, this, why is this kid calling me asking if I want to work for a biotech company when he's a nobody? Um, and we ended up just talking him into joining the team. So Scott brought in uh, Pat Conflone and, and one of our other directors, Perry Molinoff, who was the ex- in licensing director of Bristol Myers Squibb and the ex vice provost of University of Pennsylvania. Um, so again, a, a lot of it, would, I'd say luck and humility. Um, but the answer is, uh, if we were to do it again, we would one, lean on that network, which I think is important and ask those people who's available, who's interested, who are the right people. Um, but outside of that, I really do think that an executive search committee uh, professional uh, you know, recruitment group uh, would definitely be the way to go. Excellent. Thank you so much for your advice. Yeah, of course. Thank you. 
Well, and uh, thank you so much for, for the terrific question. I know Olivia, I believe you have a, a question to, or a topic to bring up. If you'd uh, turn on your audio and video, we'd love to hear it. Thank you. Um, this is my first time coming to one of these. Usually when it was in person on campus, I had class on Fridays, but now that it's online, I can come. So I'm like, woo. Um, but thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, that your story is inspiring. Um, I'm a junior in biomedical engineering at UT Dallas. And I pretty much joined because I was like, there's a problem in the world and I could probably fix it. And it sounds like something you saw too, you saw the opioid problem and you're like, I could do something about this. Why not me and not someone else sort of thing. Um, but my main question was, is that I'm a, in a similar position. Uh, I don't know if I should pursue a medical path and be the medical person in the company or the master's path and be the more business side person. So do you ever regret not being the medical person and being the one whose name is like maybe on the device or the the product you're placing or do you feel like you liked the path you chose? So for me personally, um, I'm in love with the path I chose. Uh, I think that it was absolutely the right path for me. Um, I, I fear that if I had gone into medicine uh, that I'd, I'd be a practicing medical doctor, uh, which, is not, which is not a problem. It, that's In fact, it's less of a problem. It's probably the most altruistic thing you could do with your time. Um, is devoted specifically to other people on a person by person basis, right? So huge kudos. Frankly, they're just better people than I am, right? And so uh, that's true of doctors and nurses and everybody who's in involved in that field. Um, I actually had a unique background that I didn't mention. I, I, I did one year of nursing school um, thinking that that might be an interesting background. I, I didn't necessarily have an interest in going into nursing. I just want, really wanted the background without having to go to medical school. Um, the only time I ever regretted not going to medical school uh, was when we started our clinical trials, and it drove me crazy that I couldn't, I couldn't provide input on what we were doing, right? I was just like, I don't know, right? This is over my head. I, you know, my PhD in biomedical engineering does not provide me a background in being able to talk about how the patients are going to work and react. Um, <clears throat> that said, you know, uh, a lot of CEOs are MDs and not PhDs, right? It's just a different skill set. Um, additionally, you know, chief medical officer and things like that are also opportunities. You know, lots of medical doctors get into the consulting world. Um, at UT Southwestern, actually, one of the projects I, I worked on, uh, sort of as a consultant capacity in the early days of Cersei, uh, was with some medical students um, who were developing an interesting device for. Uh, making it easier to do cesarean sections after they become impacted and you have to do, you do a C-section because the baby can't get out. Um, and one of those individuals ended up graduating from medical school and going into business. He actually never went into uh, residency or anything. He went and worked for um, either Boston Consulting Group or McKinsey or Accenture, right? One of these consulting firms. So there's a lot of opportunity, right? You don't have to take a traditional path. I don't think it's important to do so. Um, I would say... Uh, that the difference between getting a master's and a PhD uh, is, is just as different as getting a, a master's and an, and an MD or a, a PhD and an MD, right? The, the two different skill sets are fundamentally different. Um, a master's provides you with a really interesting background, a strong background in that scientific field, and a specific, albeit limited, background in whatever your project is if you're doing a thesis. By the time you get your PhD, you're really good at like this little sliver of the industry, right? And so it can be limiting if you don't get your PhD in the right thing or the thing that you're ultimately gonna end up developing. Um, so just a, a little bit of a, you know, I don't wanna say warning, but a little bit of a, a warning there, think through that carefully. I'd say getting a PhD is very similar to getting an MD in that by the time you're done with your MD, if you subspecialize or specialize, you're really good at this, right? I can do you know, brain cancer in infants under the age of X, right? I'm great at that. Um, and a PhD is, yeah, I'm really great at this very specific subsection. So I think it's a function of really understanding what, what it is you want your primary skill set to be in, right? Um, so if you are in love with the idea of, of medicine and want to be a part of that, usually what happens, by the way, is medical doctors who do practice medicine and get involved in entrepreneurship, they get to continue practicing medicine, which is special. 
Um, and you know, somebody like me, it'd be really difficult to go jump back in the laboratory and do my entrepreneurial efforts. So um, if medicine is something that you're called to, uh, I would not discourage you from doing it. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't think I was called to do it. I think I was trying to use it as a, a stepping stone. And so for anybody trying to use it as a stepping stone, it might not be for you because it's a really involved process if you're just doing it as a means to an end. Um, but if you feel called to it, I, I would definitely encourage you to, to take a hard look at it. Thank you. That was, um, I've pretty much been looking for someone to explain that to me because as a biomedical engineer, you're like, what do I do? Do I do the engineer? Do I do the medical? So I really appreciate listening and hearing your story and seeing how you can really do anything you want because you can make it however you want to make it sort of thing. Absolutely. If you go the master's route, I would encourage you to take business classes, but PhD or medicine, you'll learn it yourself. Awesome. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Uh, Rodriguez, uh, sorry, folks. Olivia, first of all, thank you very much for bringing up that topic. And it is a really important question because we want uh, our students and, and people like yourself to come up and, and do the great work to invent things, but also to get them translated out into use so that those therapies are available to help people. And um, I guess I wanted to kind of ask a follow-up question that maybe Lucas can comment on. I know people who are MD PhDs or they've done both. So it's not necessarily one or the other, you could do both. And uh, Lucas, maybe you could talk a little bit about what that path enables people to do. Yeah, the MD, MD PhD route is probably the most impressive route that I could even conceive of. Um, those people are special. Um, it is very difficult to be one of those people. Um, you've got to have your head on real tight uh, to be able to do that. It's uh, it's grueling. I think if I remember correctly, you do the first two or three years of your, P or of your medical school, and then you take like a hiatus to go do the rest of your PhD, and then you come back and have to finish. And then while you're doing your residency, you have to do a certain amount of research hours. Um, God bless MD, PhDs. Um, I'd say that the limiting factor, and this is certainly not something that is impossible to do, but I would say having an MD, PhD background makes it really difficult to leave academia um, once you're done. Uh, you've spent so much time in academia. You've probably written RO1 grants by then and have been very well funded during your residency. Uh, it makes it difficult, right? Not, albeit not impossible, but it does make it difficult to take the leap away from that. Because if you're an MD, PhD, probably you're, you're at one of the top tier institutions. You're, you're at a, you know, UT Southwestern or whatever. You're, you're doing really well. Um, and by the time you're done, you're so marketable to academia uh, that it, again, it's just difficult to leave, right? Once you're gonna get tenure right out of school and now you've got a job forever. Um, and then trying to get tenured faculty to leave a university setting is difficult because there's no guarantee they can go back. Um, I am talking to one very intelligent and motivated MD, PhD up in Northwestern actually, uh, who has broken that mold. So uh, he has started his own company a couple of years ago and just raised a $5 million round and um, is starting his organization. So it's not, it's, not that it's, it's not that it's impossible, but I would say uh, an MD, PhD route, uh, in my humble opinion, um, is they're just too smart. Uh, for their own good at this point. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's beyond my comprehension to understand what they would do next, so. I bet you there's a few of those among the students who are online here today. So uh, those people are definitely out there. Yeah. Uh, we are running out of time here. First of all, I want to thank all of you in the audience who were here for this conversation today and who are, are helping us build this important community here in Dallas-Fort Worth to improve biotech and pharmaceuticals and medical care and the health of our the people, all the people in the world. I'd like to especially thank Lucas for investing a time here with us today to, to share his knowledge and his experience. And so if you would all uh, join me briefly again in, in applause for yourselves and for Lucas here. Um, I did get several questions about access to recordings of this session. People want to hear again what you had to say, Lucas, and, and also our audience members. And uh, those of you who, even if you are a Tech Titans member, you may not be aware that there is a video library available to Tech Titans members that has recordings of 
uh, these ses this session and others. And so you have the opportunity to learn again or learn more on a different topic from a session you weren't able to attend. As you heard at the beginning of the session, uh, Barbara Tunstall is available at, at Tech Titans to talk with you about membership in the organization and how you achieve that. So with that, uh, I wanna wish all of you a happy Thanksgiving and uh, we're dismissed. All right. Thanks everyone, I appreciate awesome. it. Thanks, Thanks Lucas. Great Thanks, presentation. Lucas. Bye guys. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>